Hello and welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I will be your host for today or tomorrow or maybe even yesterday. Um, now, joining me is um, a gentleman who is the, we would call him the CEO of uh, Nuts Publishing. Um, it's a gentleman by the name of Florent Coupeau. Um, hello, Florent. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm, I'm very good. I'm very good. And yourself, are you well? Yeah, I'm well too. Yeah. Good, good, good. Um, I guess I should start by giving a little bit of a, a background to the um to the listeners as to why we've uh, we've kind of asked you on the show actually it was a, a gentleman by the name of uh, scott moore who first got in contact with us and he suggested that we had a that we had a chat um basically he he basically said that you you're um you're responsible for nuts publishing do a lot of games uh publish a fair number of games in france themselves um but your previous kind of focus was mostly kind of war games, but you've also been responsible for translating a few games as well, including um, games like One Dead Dungeon, Gloom of Killforth, 1066 Tears to Many Mothers. So um, I think Scott knows Tristan Hall quite well, and that's and Tristan's been on the show quite a few times, and so I think that's why he decided we should speak. So that's... So that's kind of nice. Um, obviously, what we like to do is we like to find out a little bit about how people got involved in the hobby, how people got involved in the business, um, give you a chance to talk an awful lot more about, you know, not Nuts Publishing itself and uh, what your aims are, your goals are and everything like that. Um, for people who are listening to the show for the first time, thank you for joining us. Um, the reason that we do this is because we're almost at 200 episodes and I might stop. I might just keep going. I have no idea. Um, but to start off, Florent, do you want to tell the listeners a little bit about how you got into the into the hobby yourself? Um, it's a long story. I started as a child uh, when I was six or seven. With a well, I'm French for my accent. Maybe you noticed. Um, <laughs> a slight hint. <head. laughs> uh, yeah, so I started a long time ago, and um, when I was uh, thirty, something like that, I I wasn't employed for a long time, and I thought, okay, let's try to redo uh, a game already published. And in fact, uh, it was medieval from GMT Games. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, from that, uh, it was it was a game that I liked a lot. And from that game on, I I just ended with a new game. And okay. from that, I thought, okay, well, let's try and get it published. So I went to well, sent my prototype to Vaivitis. Uh, mm -hmm. a French uh, magazine about war games and it was more about it was more board game historical board game not really a war game and okay. still he accepted it all right did you um did you play a lot of war games when you were growing up then was that was that kind of the main thing that that you liked about the hobby yeah yeah okay. um I grew up in the 80s and 90s and I did yeah, a lot yeah. of role playing games and war games not that okay. much of a non historical board games so I never played until uh, recently to Agricola or uh, Colons of the Caton yeah um, yeah a lot more to war games and role playing games what was your um, what was the first war game that you owned what was the Kind of the, do you remember the first one you had? I remember clearly the first one I had, and actually I bought it with my grandmother at the time. Uh, she, it was Cry Havoc, uh, so an English game. Yeah. I don't remember exactly who published it, but I bought the French version. Oh, right. And yeah, I loved it. It was, uh, you know, one X, one man. And I loved it, so I bought the whole series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you play any of the coin kind of series of games then, or 
did you did you kind of buy buy a brought over kind of did you play kind of English versions of the games as well as the French versions or did you stick slowly with the with the French versions of the games? No, at the time, you know, no internet, no cell phones, so uh, <laughs> no, it was almost impossible to get the English versions, you know, and All right. we were pretty lucky to have the a French version of these games because yeah. because not every game was were translated, you know, so uh, so yeah, these these were translated, and you know, I from that on, I went to other war games, and yeah, now I'm playing more, more and more board games because I also have kids, so it's easy, easier with them. But I'm starting mm-hmm. war games with my older older boy, so we'll see. All right, okay, okay, okay. What well, um because one of the things that people say about war war games is that they they can be qu- they can be quite difficult to learn. So I mean, you I mean, you're you said you're you're learning to play with your with your older son. I mean, is there certain games that is there certain games that you're looking forward to playing with him? The more complicated ones, as he get begins to understand it. I mean, have you started him off in any type of particular games at all? Yeah, it's. I believe in the eighties and nineties. It's true that most if not all war games were really complicated. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then um, more, uh, we have a name for for crossover war games in French, what we called uh, Warto, from the first syllable from war, war games, and then To because Euro games or board games are, should plateau. So Mm -hmm. these crossover war, uh, war games have usually less pages of rules and you can play you know if you have one or two hours in front of you then you can you can do a full game Um, when it's a a war game then you need at least three to four hours at least Um, i believe now and that's what we want to develop in our company is more light war games um, with a lot of simulation in them, but yeah. Quick, yeah. quicker to play. Okay, okay. That's a trend overall in every kind of games. So, yeah, yeah I think um, people become it's more difficult for people to have time to actually play. I yes. mean, they only have the weekend, so sometimes you know, getting sitting down for a four or five hour game becomes just more and more difficult as time goes on um so is that the kind of the i mean the i guess the the closest i've come recently to playing a board game as i played root yeah um and that was kind of fairly light i mean it was fairly tactical and it had kind of like asymmetrical kind of characters in it but it was still a fascinating kind of fun resource management area control kind of but recruit kind of game and it was absolutely kind of brilliant is that is that kind of what you're kind of aiming for then kind of going forward well we're aiming for a lot of things maybe too many but well we'll see <laughs> it's um we we believe that a lot of people are playing war games without knowing they are war games yeah. Um, yeah. for example on video games a lot of them are war games except that all the complicated rules you know is are handled by the computer um you have um lately you have the game called root yes that was the one i was playing yeah yeah this one is almost a war game i mean you know you just take different factions instead of uh you know the vagabonds and these other factions you put, I don't know, the Syrians, the Iraqi, and so on, and you you got a war game. Yeah, it's not that far. It's area controlled, and you know. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We could do that, and you know, we we got some some localizations as well as our own productions that aim for for that. It's uh, a board game, a uh, you know, a Euro game, but that feels almost like a war game, except that the theme will be different. That's all. Yes. Do you, do you think that maybe 
if you say put a board game down okay i'll be honest if somebody put a board game down in front of me which was using the same mechanics as root yeah but it had say you know this is you know this is this battle of 1862 or whatever i would probably be less likely to consider playing it because of you know just because i would say oh there's a war game it's going to be quite complicated and long to play and also the theme is going to be quite dry you know a little bit potentially a little bit kind of boring um but yeah is that your as you said you're, you're trying to move away from that and maybe make war games kind of cross over with different themes then well we we don't want really to move away we want to do both all ah, right okay uh, yeah we we want to do still uh, like uh, old school war games um games that last six hours then <laughs> okay. we, we have another line that will be games that are crossover war games so let's say two hours and then um, very light war games or even uh, how can I call it uh, confrontation euro games you know and a bit like root you know well you have some kind of fight or area controlling uh, mechanism but maybe it's going to be science fiction or just like root uh, you know uh, some kind of heroic fantasy or something like that. It... Yeah. Is it, I mean, as an aside, is it quite frustrating that games that have similar mechanics to Root have been around for years and then <laughs> somebody takes the strategy of a war game, puts some very cute animals on the front cover and then all of a sudden, people are calling this kind of um, the game of the year. I mean, I personally, I am, you know, I was playing it on Friday, as I said, and it's fantastic. And the first thing I thought was, this is brilliant. But the second thing I thought was, have I been missing out on a lot of games like this because I haven't been attracted because of the theme? And you must be sitting there thinking, we've got hundreds of games <laughs> like this that you could play and I could just imagine you busy kind of <laughs> printing off pictures of kittens and puppies and sticking them on the front cover of boxes instead. You know, there's another technique we could use is do something like Root and then, you know, do a second game, a sequel saying, okay, that is the same system. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, except that now it's not going to be cute animals. It's going to be uh, big panzers. Now, um, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> exactly. how people will react, you know. <laughs> just to see, yeah, it would just be interesting to kind of move them up through the animal kingdom. And then all of a sudden, the next version you bring out is like the Napoleonic War. But, yeah, with, but with donkeys or something, or something like that. Quite, quite frankly, it will work. I mean, you yeah. know, if you take the Spanish, uh, the Spanish War during Napoleon. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you got the French, the English, uh, the Portuguese, the Spanish, and they all are different. You know, they don't have the same strengths, and it will work. But yeah, absolutely. But yeah. you know, we would lose. Uh, you know, almost everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, the closest game I played um, before with kind of a lot of asymmetrical powers um, was Quartermaster General. Yeah. Um, which was, that was a game that, you know, I played, I played a few times and I enjoyed kind of every time kind of playing that game because the different, again, the different factors had kind of like their, the factions had different powers, which was quite, which was quite, quite cool. Um, how did you, I mean, we've kind of missed this bit out so far, but how did you get involved kind of like in Nuts Publishing? I mean, were you, were you involved in the, the board game industry before? I mean, what, what kind of led you to working at Nuts? Um, so, when Vivictis uh, agreed to my project uh, called Feudality, um, mm -hmm. then I had another job, of course, and um, 
it was in 2006. And so for 10, 11 years, I contributed to different uh, war game projects for Vaivictis. And at one point, uh, two years ago, two and a half years maybe, um, the guys from Nuts Publishing came to me and said, okay, um, we are we don't have time anymore to run the company. We are all doing it on our free time and it's you know taking too too much time. So yeah. we'd like to sell the company to somebody else. And all right. So they, I, I talked to my wife and I said, okay, uh, let's try this. But if I buy the company, you need to stay with me. Um, <laughs> So, uh, not my wife, uh, the, the other guys. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> well, my wife too, actually. <laughs> Honey, I'm buying this company and you have to stay where you are. Just like, oh, okay, I guess so. No, it was, it, it was true for both because uh, I knew it was going to take a lot of time. And, yeah. you yeah. know, every evening or you know, almost every evening. So it will be very demanding. And everybody said yes, my wife and my, my future colleagues. So, um, so yeah, I completely took over a year and a half ago, but I started really uh, two years before that. So, um, so yeah, and we're growing very fast. We have a lot of projects, uh, localizations. We, we work in three thirds. Um, one third is for localizations, pong, well, uh, some one third is for long partnerships, and the last third is uh, for our own production, well, our own designs. Sorry. Okay. And okay. you know, we try more or less to be yeah thirty percent of each. It depends, and you know, every trimester it's not always true, but we try to to have this. Was the um, was the localization something that you brought to the company, or was it something that they were already doing at Nuts already? No, that they, they before I arrived, um, they were publishing one war game every two years wow. of their own design. Yeah, and now uh, I think in two thousand eighteen we're going to do we're going to publish. Two war games and a minimum of six localizations. That's um, that's impressive. That's very impressive. And we could do a lot more, but we don't want to because we want to have uh, good quality products. We want our games to be playtested a lot. So um, and we actually for our localizations. We only accept them after playing the games. So, um, um, you know, if you don't send us a copy, then, you know, we won't take the localization. We want to be sure of what we are going to publish. If it's good mm -hmm. for us, for our, you know, edit, uh, well, publishing lines and so on. No. Is it, here's a question, is it difficult to localize a fantasy game because I noticed obviously you've, you're localizing Gloom of Killforth. Yeah. Is it difficult to localize a game where potentially the concepts might not necessarily translate well across because it is a fantasy realm and it's coming out of somebody's head? Yeah. You know, I guess if somebody's talking about, you know, if somebody's saying, oh, I'm going to be. I've made the Battle of Hastings and I want you to translate the Battle of Hastings into, you know, a French version. You're like, well, there's certain facts here and we know what the basis behind it is so we can get away with the translation. When somebody's talking about, you know, Umlock of Tharg, <laughs> you know, does that is that something that you have to take into into consideration then? Yeah, but it's it's easier actually with a fantasy game like Gloom of Gearforth than it is uh, to uh, 1066 uh, Tears to Many Mothers. Um, well, for example, just the name, Tears to Many Mothers. It's <laughs> very hard to translate in French. 
And then it's something, it's a quote from a Saxon uh, monk. Yeah. And in fact, we translate it into 1066 in Hewer and Blood, which is a quote from a Norman monk. Ah, right. Okay. So it's still a quote from, you know, the same century. But uh, we thought it was just impossible to translate Tears to Many Mothers correctly. What? Why why was it ba- why was it difficult to translate? Because I'll be honest with you, I was going to try and be clever tonight. <laughs> and I was I was going to start off by going bonjour, bienvenue à nous nous sommes pas des magiciens, je m'appelle Richard et je serai votre hôte pour aujourd'hui. Je suis a company de Floron Coupeau de Nuts Publishing. I was going to start off with that and then I thought that's going to sound silly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and you're probably shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's I just I would have understood you. No, <laughs> <laughs> but I would have been I would have been chased down the street by every other French speaking person <laughs> that came with it. You know, exactly. I mean, but that's um, I um, I was speaking to um, Nigel Kennington on the um, on the show the other um, the other day. And he was talking about translating kind of... He was using oldie languages um, because his game was based around um, H.P. Lovecraft. And he was saying some of the phrases he was trying to get translated from kind of olden Gothic English into other languages were just like really, really... Was it really, really impossible? So I think... um, I mean, when you're doing the translations, do you... Is it quite an, is it quite a difficult process? Do you have to do you translate kind of back and forth? Do you translate it from the English into the French and then look at translating the whole thing back into English to see if it's kind of it's changed or the the syntax or the content context has changed at all? Well, um, in the company, we are at least three who can you know who are almost fully bilingual. And we use also freelancers to translate, but people that we know very well. And they usually not only translate from English to French, but they also put it in the InDesign file directly. Ah, right, okay. We also have uh, special uh, softwares to help us. And we had to have a great process because when we do a war game, it's usually the other way around. We have a French designer who arrives with his great war game design, but it is in French. So we have to translate it uh, into English. And, All right, okay. and, and the thing is, uh, French and German are 30% longer than English. So sometimes the whole layout has to be different. And to go back to your previous question, uh, for Gloom of Gearforth, it's not that, uh, for me, it's easier for a fantasy game because you can invent words. Um, yeah. The example is in Gloom of Gearforth, the city is called uh, Sprawl City. Yes. Uh, we cannot stay with that word in, in French. Sometimes we do, but, you know, like one day dungeon is one day dungeon in French. Oh, yes. Sprawl City, in the it's 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 almost a role playing game. So we had to translate it, and we thought, okay, uh, what does sprawl means? And we thought, yes, okay, yes. let's try to find something short, and something easy to say, and so on. Uh, so we we went with um, I'll say it in English because I think it's almost the same word. It's uh, ample uh, a m p l e. Uh, and yeah. cité uh, for city. All right. It's a five word, five word uh, mm. uh, instead of uh, six. So we are we are even shorter than the English word. So uh, <laughs> you know, you just invent words and try to stay more or less because ample means also you know a large city. Yes. Uh, like sprawl. So we try to keep the meaning of the English uh, while changing it. But, yeah, it's 
it's easy, it's easier than, for example, we've done the localization of a uh, hand folder ring. Yes. And well, at the end of the year, we are going to release, uh, well, do on kick a Kickstarter for uh, the anniversary uh, edition of uh, War of the Ring. All right. Okay. And uh, and this is a very tough job because every word in English has a special and specific um, name in you know in, in the French books of War of the Ring. Oh right, yeah, of course. You can't just you can't just do a direct translation, can you? Because you never invent. You read the books again and again Bravo. and again and again. And this is the toughest job, you know, having a license uh, from a book. Then it's it's really tough. I, I kind of I just I I was like thinking it's like you're right because he might be known as Gandalf the Grey, but actually he might be known as something being given a completely different name. Yeah. Well. In French, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Just one example that I <coughs> never understood. In in the in the in the in the books, uh, Frodo, in French, there's an N at the end, Frodon. Oh, right. okay. Why I have no idea, but you know, <laughs> it's like, I've got to translate that. I've got to I've got to do a I've got to do a kind of a find and replace a hundred sixty seven thousand times. <laughs> it's I mean it's the main character of the book, and they even yeah. changed his name so. Yeah, so imagine you know, uh, <laughs> Riverdale is something else. Every every city, everything is different. So it's really a long, long job. So. And I can imagine you've got to be really, really careful with this because this isn't. Um, I can imagine this isn't like translating Gloom of Kilforth, where um, people aren't aware of kind of like the story. They're learning the story. There will be fans of the Lord of the Rings series that you'll get. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you'll get some annoyed, you get annoyed emails from people. So we, we uh, have two, two, three proofreaders for uh, Gloom of Guilfolds and 1066. We have uh, six yeah. proofreaders for um, Hand for the Ring. Wow. wow. Because, and they, they all know the books by heart, um, really. I mean, they, they are... <laughs> They are very, very good. Really, really good. I mean, um, sometimes on Kickstarter, you'll see um, you'll see people say, "Okay, we're going to release kind of translations of the rule books," and uh, they'll ask for help from from the backers. Um, have you had more companies? Kind of approaching you now to do translation services is it is it is it a is it a difficult thing to market or is it is it becoming more and more available or more easier to tell people about it because it's one of these things I mean I only know <clears throat> I only know a lot more about kind of translation because um, I work with businesses that sell on Amazon and they sell into Amazon Europe. So when they're translating like product names, for instance, a, a, a product name that makes perfect, perfect sense in English makes no sense whatsoever in, in French. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't make any sense. So I've got to work with a translation company and make sure that they, they're not always translating the words, but they've also got to give them context to the words as well. So it's, I mean, um, are you, I mean, have you found that your services as a, as a, as a I mean, you've obviously done six titles this year, have, have you got more and more interest in the translation services? Um, just just okay. translating games, uh, we've been asked only once. Um, what we do for localization is we translate and produce and distribute the game. Just pure translations, not yet, but mm -hmm. why not? I mean, why not? No, it's um, it's such a specific vocabulary that yes. it, it would make sense. Yes. Yes, I can imagine just that if you once you understand, because there will only be so many mechanics, I guess, in board games. Yeah. 
and I guess once you get a famil- a familiarity with the naming of certain things, then you become you'll obviously become become kind of better better than that. Um, I mean, as as you're talking about the localization and then distribution, um, do you get is there calls for games? Is there games you'd like to translate? Is there games that you would love to be in charge of creating the kind of the the French version? Is there anything you'd love to get your hands on to kind of do the translation for? Um, well, uh, right now, Root. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> you know, I, I suppose I'm late, and uh, you know, all the com- all the French companies got it already. But well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, I must say that it's an honor to do War of the Ring. Yes. It's an old game, but the second edition never uh, was never published in French. So um, yeah. Yeah. we believe there's a market for, for that one. Um, then, then there's so many old good games and new good games that, you know, we're... Um, right now, I don't know. Um, we are very happy with One Deck Dungeon. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, that is, I think, really a great game. Uh, there's One Deck Galaxy coming out um, at the end of the year. And, well, for us in French, uh, Forest of Shadows is coming out at the end of the year also. So we have quite a, a delay. <laughs> Uh, compared mm-hmm. to the to the the English version, um, we got also the Lost Expedition and its expansion. Oh yeah, yeah. But as as a new game uh, in French, well, um, if you have any suggestion, uh, you know, I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to hear it. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of games out there that just don't end up getting translation. I mean, there, there must be so many. And there's also probably quite a few in the past which didn't get a translation kind of as, as kind of well. Um, with you producing your own games, are you are you translating these into English as well now? I mean, obviously you do your own versions. Are you, are you automatically doing, kind of considering English versions or do you have to wait and see what the demand is like? Well... Um, for our own designs, we always publish them in English. Uh, All right, okay. okay. But we are trying to think about uh, a solution to publish them in French too, and maybe in other languages. Um, it's easier for uh, we we don't want we don't want just to give a PDF. We we want to do a full version of the game in other languages. Yeah. And for now, because we are doing expert games, um, it's not possible to do it ourselves. So that, that's why we're licensing our games. Um, <laughs> but then okay. maybe okay. if we do smaller games, we'll do it ourselves. But there's another problem. It's distribution. Um, if you just want to do a Kickstarter then you know you can do any language and just distribute it after the kickstarter but if you want yes, to yes. go into retail then that is a different matter because i know pretty well the english the american or the us and the german markets and they are all different and we're too small i don't want to Although I know how they work, I don't want to end all that. So it's easier to find a, a partner who does it than ourselves. But okay. It's okay. Okay. I, okay. I'd like when we release a game, you know, it's if if a partner is ready to to have the license, you know, it's uh, it, it would be great. Okay, okay. Have you thought about kind of doing more kind of non war game? games or are you quite happy continue to, to produce them no well um again <laughs> we're trained by thirds um yeah one third will be um old school war games 
one third will be you know um, expert euro games or historical board games and then one third maybe less may, probably not more will be uh, non-historical board games um, we got several in uh, development uh, now so um, yeah we got uh, we got one. I think that's the one I can talk now because uh, <laughs> we we can do we will do demos uh, at Essen. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Called Mini Rogue. Okay. Uh, maybe some of you have heard about it because uh, it was part of a of a contest, a nine card contest on Board Game Geek. Yes. Uh, yes. I believe it was two or three years ago. Two two years ago. Yes. And and. The designers are uh, French Canadians, and when I spoke to them at first, they wanted to release the game by themselves, and then then they they got overwhelmed by um, you know the whole process of publishing a game, and they mm -hmm. thought, okay, we speak French, you speak French, let's let's do business <laughs> together, and uh, so now Nuts Publishing is publishing it. Yeah. But you know we are in close relationship with uh, Gabriel and Paolo, so um, you can come if you come to Essen, you can come to our booth and uh, or our stand, and uh, we'll do a, we'll do a, a demo of of this game. Excellent, excellent. Do you still get involved in the design side? I mean, with you kind of being the head of the company, do you still get the time to play about with white? pieces of paper and dice and counters and are you still able to do design in yourself or is that something you have had to take a step away from? Very good question. Um, I think it's in my blood now. So I I try from time to time to continue designing war games. And actually the next one, uh, it's, it's funny that you asked that question because of uh, the... The chief editor of Five Eighties just asked me the same question uh, today. So, uh, all right, okay. And I told him that for uh, uh, next summer, I would uh, give him the design of a game called uh, Basilius uh, Two because I already d did the, the first one. Yeah. And it is a game about um, so the, the wars of the Byzantine Empire in the 10th and 11th century, so very specialized. But it's very small, so you can play, uh, you, you can have a game uh, that lasts one hour only. So for a war game, it's very, very short. That is very short. I mean, Root took 90 minutes to play, so that's to play in an hour. That's. Um... I know a lot of kind of non-war game kind of games that take at least an hour and a half to kind of play. So that's kind of that's kind of exciting. What about other types of genres of games? Would would we ever see kind of like a a space game coming out of Nuts Publishing? Would you ever go go, go down of that line? Do you have a miniatures game ready to go kind of thing? You know, is there is there that kind of thing? Kind of going on so uh, for localizations yes we do have miniature games like uh, subterra um, yes. yeah. the great war from psc games mm -hmm. um i think for these are the two uh but for our own designs no uh, we don't want to go into miniatures uh, compared to a lot of other companies uh primarily because We've seen the problems that miniatures, um, you know, what you ha what kind of problems you have with miniatures. I live in the same town as Monolith. We did Conan, and <laughs> I've never met them, none of them in person. But yeah. you know, I saw what they did and what they went through, and no, <laughs> at least no, and. <laughs> did you did you walk past the building and they were crying? Because <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I heard about Conan was um, it took a long time for the Kickstarter to come out, and I know that 
I, I, I think I've mentioned this, I mentioned this ages ago, but when a lot of people got their Kickstarter Conan package delivered, they had instantly listed it for sale because they had been waiting kind of so long. I'm interested to see what happens with Batman, but um, it's strange because um, there still seems to be a lot of... Um, there's a lot of kind of miniature games kind of going to kind of Kickstarter still. I mean, is that is that a route you would go down? I mean, so, I mean, the names that you've mentioned so far. I mean, Subterra, Gloomy Come Forth, Ten Sixty Six, Tears for Many Mothers. They all went. They all came from Kickstarter. I mean, is that something you guys you would consider yourselves, or are you quite happy to stay within the kind of the the self publishing model? I think we're going to mix uh, all of the, the different systems. Um, they all have their advantages and disadvantages. One thing I can promise is that I don't want to make people wait too long. Uh, yeah. I think we're experienced enough now to know all the different processes. So mm-hmm. um, that we have a lot of games in development right now. But we promised ourselves that when we would go to Kickstarter with one of our games, it would be finished. Um, For example, for Mini Rogue, it is finished. So we're going to demo the game, send copies all over the world, and only then we'll do a Kickstarter campaign, not before. I don't want to rush things. you know, I, I've been a backer of a lot of Kickstarters and, you know, when you wait a year, uh, you forget about what you <laughs> pledged. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. one day you receive you receive the game and you say, what? Oh, gr- I know. oh that was that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it took a knock on, knock on the door and it's a, there's a box and you're like, what's this? <laughs> so, no, we... We won't do that. It's, uh, for example, we're doing the localization of Australia from Martin Wallace. Yes. And this is the model I want to have. This game arrived to us as a prototype. It was almost like the final version. We improved Uh some things, but it was really near perfection. Um, Then uh, Amanda, who was the lead uh, project uh, uh, manager um, she did a great 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 job uh, she handled the whole process very carefully and you know it was really great and from the start of the kick the end of the kickstarter to well essen when we get the game uh, it's seven months and it's more than well, it's seven partners uh, you know, something like uh, 20,000 copies. Uh, it was wow. a huge success, but it was very hard to handle for her. And yes. she did it perfectly. And I want to take that in, in as a model because her game, when she sent it to, to us, was just finished, completely finished. Just, you know, small details of that. So, yeah. It it happened. Good good Kickstarter happens. I mean, they're all good when, but you know, quick Kickstarters. Yeah, I think um, it's kind of um, again not going back to kind of root. <laughs> yeah, we have to. But I have to get that game then. They well they they basically kind of one minute they were saying okay um, we're kind of closing the pledge manager. And then the next minute they were saying, confirm your address because it's coming out to you kind of next week, which was, I was taken, I thought it was, it was quite shocking because it was like, it was, it kind of finished earlier this year. And I remember kind of seeing it and thinking, well, that'll be something to, to kind of look forward to. Because usually what will happen is they'll have a closing date on the kind of the pledge manager and then that'll be it and it'll sit there waiting until it's ready to go and then you'll get potentially an email saying sorry guys there's going to be another three you know three months but the next thing you know I'm getting an email saying um, this is ready to be delivered and I'm like whoa 
So well, I think a little bit more experience now. Uh, you're never sure of when when you know the boat uh, coming from China will arrive. Uh, yeah, you know, especially in France. Um, <laughs> just just a short story uh, for the Great War. Um, the the pilots was were supposed to arrive uh, two weeks ago. And mm -hmm. in France, we only have one harbor uh, that handles big, uh, big vessels. And they just pass by this harbor, Le Havre, because it's actually very small compared to um, Antwerpen and Rotterdam. So, yeah. so they just said, OK, we're late. Well, Le Havre, you'll get your pellets later. Let's wow. deliver the first uh, biggest uh, harbors first. And then they went back to Le Havre, but with two weeks, um, de a two weeks delay. And there's nothing you can do about it. And, you know, it's... No way. And, well, then maybe... We, we didn't get that, but maybe then the customs will uh, have a check and find something. And, you know, <laughs> two weeks more. And... And, oh so my goodness. and at the end, your game is fine, you know, but you got a month's delay and it's not really your fault. You know, it's uh, so, yeah, I, I think I think it's expected, though. I think if people are regulars on Kickstarter, then they'll be used to it. I think when there's an issue is when it's maybe an IP, when people have back to get, I mean, Let's you know, Monolith and Batman, the Dark Souls board game, um, you know, Resident Evil board game, it's like if they were any other IP, if there's a delay on them, then they would be fine because people would be saying, This is fine, it's in development. I think as soon as um Dark the Dark Souls board game, Steamforged have announced, you know, there's they're under um they obviously are dealing with um, an IP owner. So they say, we're going to change this. And in order for them to change this, they've got to go through a process to get a model, a miniature changed, which is probably another reason that you're right, that you shouldn't be using a, a going near miniatures, um, Laurent. But um, well, the, the key uh, is, is communication, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think... You have to tell the truth and you have to communicate very regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Then, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, what can, what's going to be, what can we look forward to in the next couple of months from Nuts? What, you know, what, what should we be keeping an eye out for from yourselves? Um, in English, uh, you should check a Kickstarter campaign for Mini Rogue. Uh, probably in January or February of next year. Okay. Um, then we are also going to release a, a very small, well, not small, but quick uh, uh, war game, more crossover war game called Saigon 75. Okay. It's a block game, uh, one hour, uh, one or two uh, players. So there's a solo mode that we're playtesting right now. Yeah. Um, we have uh, well it's a working title we have a game which is called uh, Megaboo <laughs> okay. this one is not historical it doesn't sound that it. <laughs> it's a family game it's a family game uh, about a, a, a merchant um, a space merchant um, uh, ship in space, and you must collect uh, gems and treasures and so on. And there's also uh, a pirate ship uh, that, that can, you know, uh, kind of, uh, in, uh, what's the name? Uh, prevent the the merchant from uh, doing everything he wants. So this is a yeah. really a, a family yeah. family game. There's also another game that I think I never told anyone about uh, that is very advanced. Uh, this one is called Moog, and oh. it's also a game, um, at first won, I think it won several awards on on a nine-card contest on board, board Game Geek. Yeah. 
this one is a war game, but uh, the the way it's done, it's really a Euro game. It's uh, you got a mammoth in the middle and two tribes of pre 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 prehistorical men. Sorry, mm. and uh, you can play one. Uh, yeah, one, two, three, four players, and usually yeah, it's yeah. two teams of two um, uh, cavemen, and they need to kill the mammoth. And the system, the game system, handles the the mammoth, so it can turn around, charge, and so on. And and the the cavemen can must kill it, but they can jump on top of it. And yeah, that's it's really fun really really fun it doesn't it doesn't feel like a war game really it doesn't sound like a war game at all. <laughs> really it, it's meant not to be a war game <laughs> it's kind of like your version of root that's quite cool <laughs> basic basically just go on bgg and type m o o g h and right. you you'll find the the print and play version of of mooc excellent Excellent. Excellent. And the illustrations are just great. Fantastic. If um, if people have listened along today and if they want to find out more um, about Nuts, about yourself, um, where can we find you on the, the internet webs? Normally we have a website, uh, you type uh, Nuts Publishing, so N-U-T-S and publishing.com. Mm -hmm. uh, then we'll be at Essen. Uh, we are usually, well, I am usually at UK Game Expo. We'll try to get a stand next year. Yes. Uh, so you can come and meet us next year. Um, we also have a Facebook page in English and in French. So, oh, okay. So uh, a Twitter also. Um, so yeah, just type uh, "nuts publishing" on Facebook, and you should uh, you should find us. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, what we'll do is um, we will take all those links and we will put them in our show notes, so that um, we have notes to show. Um, thank you very very much for coming on. Thank you too. Oh, this has good. been this has been this has been a pleasure. Um, if you want to keep an eye on what we are doing, uh, you can find us on Twitter at We're Not Wizards. You can find us on Facebook at We're Not Wizards. We are on um, Instagram at We're Not Wizards. You can find us on the website, which is We're Not Wizards dot com. Um, if you're looking for the occasional reviews and previews and even opinion pieces, we have a blog now, which is We're Not Wizards dot blogspot dot com. Um, if you want to um, email us, it's magic at we're not wizards dot com, and uh, if you want to, if you've listened tonight and you're listening for the first time and you want to subscribe to us, then if you go to Stitcher or Spreaker or Acast or Podknife or Player FM or everywhere you get your podcast, then please drop us a subscription. Um, if you like us a lot, then please go to Apple Podcasts and drop us a subscription and a um, and a rating. If you like us even more, please drop us a review because that would be fantastic. As we say, if you are dropping us a review, then don't give us ten stars because that makes us um, big headed. But don't give us don't give us one star because that makes us cry. Give us five because it's in the middle and it's average and we are just a little bit average but the gentleman who has not been average tonight he's been formidable <laughs> it is it uh, <laughs> um it is um mr florent coupeau um thank you very very much for coming on there's only um two more things to do um the first thing is to remember that we are many things but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Floro? Oh, you're pretty much like wizards, I think. Uh, don't, that, don't, 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 don't. No, 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 no. <laughs>
<laughs> and the um, <clears throat> the second thing is to say goodbye. So it's a goodbye from Florence. Say goodbye, sir. <laughs> goodbye. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see. And it is a goodbye from me. Remember, uh, stay safe. Roll sixes dot com. And um, you know, um, that's publishing are going to be doing a lot of wonderful things. So check the show notes, um, give them a look, check out the games they're going to be bringing over here. And until next time, uh, salut maintenant. A bientôt.